Uchtrain Achorda, it is a great privilege to, be, to participate in the fourth installment of Machnev and to share some reflections with you on how the events of a century ago shaped church-state relations. Between 1918 and 1923, the stance of the Irish Catholic hierarchy was characterized by repudiation of political violence, but not the goal of Irish independence, obeisance to the legally constituted government, advocacy of majority rule, hostility towards partition, and perhaps most of all, a desire for peace, order, and stability. Three issues mentioned by Professor Ferreter were of particular significance to church authorities. Upholding democratic principles, the Ulster question, and misplaced hopes in the Boundary Commission. When the negotiations in London began, the hierarchy issued a resolution seeking permanent friendship between the two countries and calling for, quote, a great act of national freedom, untrammeled by limitations and free from the hateful spirit of partition. The bishops were distressed by the plight of Northern nationalists who had borne the brunt of sectarian strife in Northern Ireland since the summer of 1920. The hierarchy had frequently condemned what they considered a campaign of extermination, but during the treaty negotiations, they maintained a discreet silence. Whereas the hierarchy had been regularly consulted about home rule by the Irish party, that was not the case with Sinn Féin ahead of the treaty negotiations. An exception was the involvement of senior clergy and five northern bishops in the Committee of Information on the case of Ulster, established in September 1921 to assemble information for the Irish delegation. If anything, this reflected Sinn Féin's lack of knowledge of northern conditions as much as the centrality of the church in northern political life. Unsurprisingly, the bishops welcomed the treaty and favored its ratification. On the 13th of December, they issued a careful statement that praised the patriotism and honesty of purpose of the Irish negotiating team and hoped that TDs in the Dáil would have before their minds the best interests of the country. As those parliamentary debates became increasingly polarized, the bishops exerted political and moral pressure on TDs to uphold majority opinion by supporting the treaty. Archbishop Edward Byrne of Dublin wrote to Eamon de Valera on the 3rd of January, 1922, to suggest a means whereby de Valera and others could register their protest against the treaty but avoid, in the Archbishop's words, being placed in the undesirable position of acting against the declared will of the people. This appeal was unsuccessful. Among the Northern bishops, enthusiasm for the settlement was tempered by anxiety about partition. The big blot on the treaty, as Bishop Patrick McKenna of Clutter put it, they reluctantly concluded that the treaty offered the best hope of all Ireland unity. This was not as absurd as it might appear in hindsight. It was rooted in the expectation, something encouraged by Griffith and Collins, that Northern Ireland would be forced to accept inclusion into the Irish Free State. The influential Bishop Joseph McRory of Down and Connor brought three concerns to a meeting of the Provisional Government in Dublin at the end of January 1922. The first was the hope that James Craig, the Northern Premier, could be urged to come into the Irish Free State at once. The second were concerns that Catholic education would be safeguarded. And the third was the Bishop's fear that the policy of non-recognition of the Northern Government advocated by Michael Collins, would in fact leave Northern nationalists fighting alone. Collins mollified the bishop by agreeing to pay the salaries of teachers who refused to recognize 
the Northern Ministry of Education, and also by establishing a North Eastern Advisory Committee, which included Bishops McRory, Mulhern, and McKenna. In the event, the policy of non-recognition ended with the death of Collins, and any vague hopes of an all-Ireland settlement were extinguished on the 7th of December 1922, when James Craig excluded Northern Ireland from the jurisdiction of the Free State under the treaty. Against a deteriorating political and military situation, most Catholic bishops used their Lenten pastorals in February 1922 to bolster support for the treaty. Archbishop Gilmartin of Tume prayed for deliverance from the curse of disunion, a theme put more forcefully by Michael Fogarty of Killaloo, who stated, Ireland is now the sovereign mistress of her own life. The rusty chains of bondage are scrapped forever, unless, indeed, by our own folly, we put them on again. In word and deed, the hierarchy attempted to avert the disaster of civil war. A statement on the 26th of April 1922 made clear their view that the treaty was a national question that could only be settled by the national will and that the anti-treatyite occupation of the four courts amounted to military despotism and a confiscation of the people's rights. A second statement offered a bitter reflection on the Northern government, which was ranked, and I quote, more nearly with the government of the Turk in his worst days than with anything to be found anywhere in a Christian state, and where Catholics were subjected to a savage persecution, which is hardly paralleled by the bitterest suffering of the Armenians, end of quote. Now also at this time, the Lord Mayor of Dublin and Archbishop Byrne held a conference of pro and anti-treaty representatives in the Mansion House. This effort at mediation, predictably perhaps, ended in failure. Divisions over the treaty and the outbreak of civil war dismayed Northern nationalists and their clerical leaders. As early as January 1922, Cardinal Michael Logue of Armagh had to be talked out of publicly condemning the stance of de Valera. Northern nationalist grievances were augmented by the abolition in September 1922 of proportional representation in local government elections and the subsequent redrawing of electoral boundaries and furthermore, the imposition of a declaration of allegiance and service to the monarch and his government in Northern Ireland. The Catholic hierarchy unequivocally upheld the authority of the provisional government on the outbreak of civil war and was committed to the survival of the treaty settlement. Throughout the summer, individual bishops repeatedly decried violations of moral law. This was easier in 1922 than during the War of Independence because in Patrick Murray's evocative phrase, the church was sustaining the authority of an Irish state. This extended to producing a politically partisan pastoral on the 10th of October, 1922, which rejected the legitimacy of the Republican campaign because, quote, no one is justified in rebelling against the legitimate government set up by the nation and acting within its rights. Now, this was something reinforced by the overwhelming endorsement of the treaty at the June 1922 election. The pastoral also threatened to deprive those engaged in unlawful rebellion of the sacraments and to suspend priests who gave spiritual aid to the anti-treaty IRA. Outraged Republicans subsequently petitioned the Pope. The effectiveness of the October 1922 pastoral was, however, uncertain. It may have emboldened the government in its ruthless prosecution of the civil war. Privately, the bishops were appalled 
at the policy of summary executions, which our Archbishop Byrne considered not only unwise, but entirely unjustifiable from the moral point of view. Episcopal appeals for clemency were ignored, and this is a reminder to us of the limited political influence of the bishops at this time. However dismayed their lordships were in private at the excesses of the Irish government and the National Army during the Civil War, no public condemnation was issued. In this, there was an element of pragmatic self-interest. The unpalatable reality of a northern government hostile to Catholic interests increased the hierarchy's determination to secure the free state and the opportunities that it promised, not least for the church. For northern nationalists and church figures, the treaty settlement and the Boundary Commission were regarded as a means of salvation from the northern government. Lobbying by clergy in border areas led to the establishment of a North East Boundary Bureau in October 1922 to compile data in anticipation of the commission. The commission, of course, was delayed until November 1924 by the civil war in Ireland and by political instability in Britain. The hopes of northern nationalists were shattered in November 1925 when the leaked Boundary Commission report recommended only minor changes to the 1920 boundary. The controversial report was suppressed and the British, Free State and Northern governments agreed in December to leave the political boundary unaltered. The bitterness of Northern nationalists was captured by Keir Healy, the Sinn Féin MP for Fermanagh and Tyrone. He described the agreement in December as, quote, a betrayal of the nationalists of the North and a denial of every statement put forward by the Free State in their alleged support of our cause since 1921. John Redmond was driven from public life for even suggesting partition for a period of five years. The new leaders agreed to partition forever." End of quote. So there was a sense, as Oliver Rafferty has argued, that Northern nationalists and their clerical leaders felt alienated from both parts of the island at this time. And this is another manifestation of that sense of disillusion that uh, Dermot and Mary have referred to uh, in their papers. The settlements, divisions, and strife of the early 1920s shaped church-state relations on the island in five significant ways. First, despite political partition, all the main Christian churches continued to operate on an all-Ireland basis. This did not mean, of course, that Catholic bishops accepted partition. One example of this um, comes from Derry. In his consecration uh, address as bishop in 1926, Bernard O'Kane referred to the anomaly and absurdity of having one part of his diocese in one kingdom and the remainder in another state, and he pledged to work for a united Ireland. But for the Catholic Church, there was never any question that partition would compromise or fracture its religious unity. The Church's map image remained an undivided all-Ireland one. Second, partition proved deeply traumatic for the Catholic Church. Given the number of its adherents in Northern Ireland, the appalling civil strife there between 1920 and 1922 and the church's fears for Catholic education. Unsurprisingly, resentment and political aloofness lingered, a sense of being in, but certainly never of, the northern state. Among church leaders, this only changed significantly when the opportunities occasioned by the welfare state after the Second World War demanded greater pragmatism in their interactions with the northern state. Third, partition reinforced the association of political allegiance and religious affiliation on both sides of the border. In 1926, 
93% of the population of the Free State was Catholic. This had a significant bearing, of course, on the political and public culture and on the status enjoyed by the Church. Fourth, the Catholic Church played a significant role in the state-building project by providing an unrivaled institutional presence in the Free State and dominating significant policy areas, education in particular. And lastly, Catholicism helped to bind some of the wounds inflicted by the Civil War in the South. There was remarkably little Republican resentment towards the Church, and no anti-clerical party developed. The devout Catholicism of de Valera and many of his soldiers of destiny helped to ensure continued harmony in church-state relations when Fianna Fáil took office in 1932. Shinawil Gurumahagur.